So with the next COP in the next weeks, and I think the first question to you is, um, why do we need the COP? Please make it short, and three key points. So why do we need the COP? And I think Anna, because you are on the left, you can start. <laughs> Thank you, Kilian. I hope this works and you can hear me. Um, why do we need COP? Because it's the only you know, international process that brings everyone together, you know, all parties to UNFCCC, and it's the, the main convening forum to agree on collective climate action. Since uh, climate change is an international issue, there definitely needs to be a conference that brings all uh, stakeholders from international levels, obviously the parties, but it's also important that... But it's, but it's also important that we... <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's also important that we bring uh, the parties together with different stakeholders that are non-government as well, so that everyone can interact. Um, first of all, thank you for having me tonight. And uh, I wouldn't uh, agree more with Anna and Asia of what they have said. So the COP is simply the an institutional mechanism that keep accumulating all the agreements between the parties with our countries or non-governmental actors. And it's a process, it's a, it's a, it's a moving target all the time, um, just reaching agreements and trying to implement them. Uh, so thank you all. Since uh, the British Embassy and the, the British government has the la or they had the last uh, COP presidency, um, what or how could you or how would you define the role of a COP presidency uh, to all of our um, viewers here? And how can a president this presidency influence the negotiations? Mm -hmm. So I think the role of the presidency is that of an honest broker. So it's not so much about pushing a certain negotiating position or setting your own clearly defined agenda, but it's about supporting the process and making sure that at the end of the conference you have an outcome that can be supported by, by all parties um, and is also, of course, an, an inclusive reflection of the conversation with different stakeholders, as, as Asia has mentioned. And as you know, if one single country objects to the outcome, then the whole the whole conference fails, um, as we saw, you know, in, in 2009. So, I think this sort of honest broker approach is um, is really important, and it, it's not an easy one because it really requires, I think, the presidency to take a step back from your own your own set of priorities, um, while still being mindful of how to best achieve an ambitious negotiating outcome. Um, so how you will uh, do it as a British uh, presidency, as an um, Egypt presidency uh, in the next weeks? So what's your position, how you will try to make it that there's a conclusion paper that all uh, participants conclude on one thing at the end of the COP? Sure. Um, first of all, as uh, Anna said, uh, Glasgow had made a, a major breakthrough when it comes to the commitments and uh, uh, documents like Glasgow Pact, for example. Uh, they have been setting the target very high. So the Egyptian presidency will be just majorly focusing on implementation. We had many cups, many documents out of it, many agreements, commitments that we have to follow up on. So we are making our focus now on implementation of what we have agreed upon. This is, uh, will be the main theme of uh, COP27 in Sharm el -Sheikh. Okay, thank you. Um, I was also part of the last COP and I was uh, part of also Klima delegation last year and um, was there in Glasgow and out of the NGOs there was there were also some critic uh, things. Um, Asia, so how about critics um, over the to the last COP and what you hope for the next COP um, that to improve that will be better than last year or uh, so what are your thoughts about that? So obviously uh, the COP there were some breakthroughs made at the last COP at COP26. Uh, when it comes to um, coal phase out, uh, methane phase out, uh, the pledges that were made, also in terms of loss and damage, the pledges that were made uh, or are set to be made 
I think it's important to note that there was progress made. However, if we look at core phase out, for example, uh, during COP26, the final way it was phrased was core phase down and not core phase out. So obviously we need to, for the future, work more on, on really not, uh, not watering down, so to say, the goals and we need to work really proactively and when it comes to loss and damage it was good that it was uh, brought up and uh, so to say um, brought into a conversation however the notes of the Warsaw International Mechanism uh, last year concluded that a lot of the discussions are supposed to take place at the next COP so COP27 so obviously at COP27, it's really important that those conversations that are supposed to be held uh, then are also held and that we don't keep pushing things away for the next COP and the next because climate change doesn't wait. We've seen throughout the summer that losses and damages also don't wait. So what we need for the upcoming COP is proactive ac uh, proactive uh, a proactive approach uh, and uh, a tackling of the issue so as you've said Karim um, implementation and not just discussions uh, uh, thank you I'll, we're talking a little bit now about the, the topics I will just go a little bit about the how the, the COP also works, so um, how's about the, the place, uh, the place for the observers. Uh, so last year maybe there was a little bit too, uh, too less space for observers, so uh, we couldn't come into the negotiations, there were only so less places. Um, so do you have thoughts about that, Asya? Um, how it should work uh, at this COP, um, how the participation of especially youth NGOs and, and all of the NGOs could work and what could be problems there? Um, yeah, so we have a saying in Bosnia, the youth, is, uh, the youth is the population that the world remains on. So obviously that is true in any language, in any culture, I would say. And that's why youth needs to be included, not only as observers, but in general, there should be like an inclusion of youth. I think this year we're somewhat on a good path. There will be a youth pavilion, which is obviously something that we need to look forward to. Um, however, in general, NGO action is needed. As uh, UN Secretary General has said, uh, climate activists are not the radicals. They are the ones asking for progress. Those who are radical are the countries who keep investing in uh, non-sustainable energy sources. So obviously, there needs to be um, there needs to be the NGO sector pushing for more, and a lot of governments from the bilateral meetings that I got to attend, a lot of governments will tell you uh, we need the NGOs to keep pushing for something so that we can like that we stand a chance in like pushing it to the table and negotiating about it. So obviously, you need to have the you need to have the NGOs pushing for change so that change can be negotiated and in the end adopted. Uh, thank you. So I'll talk, I talked a little bit about critics about the last COP. Um, so what uh, did you, uh, what uh, conclusions you made out of the last COP uh, regarding the youth and the NGOs in total? And what did you give also to the next presidency? Um, what should be better? So what are your thoughts about that, Anna? Yeah, it's, it's a very good, very good question. I mean, for the UK presidency, adopting an inclusive approach to COP to the presidency was was very important. It was something we emphasised from from early on, and there was sort of regular fora of exchange to make that possible. So um, Alex Sharma, who hosted um, um, the Glasgow summit, uh, had regular meetings with uh, youth reps, also with uh, representatives of indigenous uh, communities, and um, there was a group sort of called Friends of COP, which brought together a range of um, stakeholders, scientists, but also ac activists to advise the presidency and uh, make sure that um, they remain connected to the, to the demands of, of the people. Um, what you refer to in terms of the lack of access, um, 
I myself wasn't in Glasgow, actually. We weren't able to go because of the you know, restrictions and numbers. We were hosting this in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we also had a lot of people who were um, uneasy about traveling to Glasgow and having an in-person meeting. So we got a lot of pushback, actually, from also from some civil society groups who felt that you couldn't host an inclusive COP in the circumstances of a pandemic. But then our position was, well, we can't not host the COP after, you know, there has been a two-year gap. We have seen that virtual negotiations only take us so far, but they can't replace in-person dialogue. So we opted for hosting a physical COP, but it did mean we had to um, restrict access to some of the negotiating rooms. And I know that this sort of caused some um, sort of some some discomfort or it was some um, yeah some some critical voices that it wasn't it wasn't open enough. Um, I don't have an easy <laughs> advice or answer to that dilemma because in a way we're still operating in the in, in the context of a, of a pandemic, although things do feel like they are a bit a bit more back to normal now. But um, I would say that you know making sure maintaining as many channels of communication open. Um, and I would say that you know this inclusive approach to COP did manage to generate, to contribute to the success of the Glasgow uh, summit, um, the fact that the, the pact was adopted, the numerous initiatives, the sectoral commitments that uh, countries made, those wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had a lot of you know, non-state actors uh, from all areas of society on board with these, including the private sector and, and other, other stakeholders. So th that would be my, my steer. Um, so you do have any uh, um, things you'll do in the next COP regarding youth and also the, the total NGO involvement. So what are your plans for that for this year, uh, Karim? Sure. Um, this is a very important aspect. And let me just start by saying that um, it's not just an Egyptian presidency for the COP. It's an African COP. I mean, when we are talking about Africa, we are talking about 60% of the population under 30 years old. Uh, this ratio in Egypt is 70%, which means that my country, 70 million Egyptians are under 30. So we cannot emphasize more uh, the rule of youth. And this has been already translated in many actions. So, for example, we are hosting before, just before the COP, from the 2nd to the 4th of November, uh, the COI 17, the Conference of Youth 17 in Sharm el Sheikh. And it had been already uh, channeled that the outcomes of this conference, this very important conference, uh, will be just reflected in one of the thematic days of the COP 27. So the Egyptian presidency had also allocated one thematic day for youth and, and future generations. Um, so we can have the voice of the youth directly in the COP27, and that could be reflected in the outcomes of the COP27. Um, this is not the only thing that the Egyptian presidency for the COP27 had made uh, when it comes to youth. Um, we had also, uh, for the first time, uh, a youth pavilion that had been run and owned by youth. This is for the first time, and the COP will be in Sharm el-Sheikh as well. This maybe when it comes to youth, uh, for civil society and NGOs, um, of course, um, uh, they, are, they are one of the main actors. And I'm here to um, just say that um, in the same sense, the Egyptian presidency had already allocated one thematic day, a whole day to discuss uh, it's for civil society and the role of civil society in the COP. Until the moment, and maybe I can share those numbers with you, uh, we have 9,800 representatives who, from the civil society around the world who will just participate in Sharm el -Sheikh. This is above the average number, usually, that can go to COP. Um, we had some, some, some challenge that um, usually the COP is the conferences that have been run by the UN, the UNFCCC, and um, the, the host country wouldn't have huge leverage, it's just upon the criteria of the UNFCCC. So even when it comes to registration of the civil society. So when we had this, uh, there was a situation that only one single NGO had been registered and upon the criteria of the UNFCCC in the COP27. 
And we had to just do our endeavor with the UNFCCC that we managed exceptionally to get one registration, one exceptional registration for COP27 for 36 Egyptian NGO and 20 African NGO, just because we know and we understand that should be reflected, they are one of the main actors to the COP. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, pretty nice to hear the numbers um, of the NGOs who will participate. Um, so there were also a little bit discussion about the, the hotel costs in this year because I think in the last year there were the, was the nice um, organization of the human hotel um, of like there were some people in, or many people in Glasgow who hosted uh, NGOs, youth NGOs from all around the world. So we also participated in this and it was a pretty nice experience because we also came in touch with uh, the people uh, in Glasgow um, and also the, the hotel prices were I think not that high like this year. So I think there's also a high financial barrier to come to COP. So what, are the, what were the problems this year that the hotel corporation couldn't or did fail a little bit and how should the man or should be this be managed in the next years on next cops? Okay. You can okay. start. Okay. And okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, th th that's usually a valid point because uh, usually the cops it hosts uh, uh, big numbers of participants, and here we are talking about an estimate maybe of fifty to sixty thousand people who will be just coming to the same city, the same. Um, area and that will create a high demand usually on the hotels and, and, and um, uh, whatever available units for accommodation. Um, and uh, despite of that, we just have anticipated such kind of demand and um, we have made the priority to the Global South NGOs and the Global South Youth representation because you can imagine this will be the most struggling uh, when it comes to the challenges of of, of uh, making it to the cops. And that's why uh, the Egyptian government had subsidized some of the accommodation and hotel rooms for those categories. And it's, it's, uh, we are talking about a number or, or a cost that could, could vary from 30 to 50 uh, US dollar uh, per night. And that somehow should be, should be affordable. We are playing that role again, and we're trying to create more uh, vacancies when it comes to accommodation. But I have to mention that it's challenging, of course, but we are doing our best to make it. OK. So we'll also now go a little bit for, uh, deeper in the um, uh, topics we, uh, that, that were discussed in last year. So Asya, you also already mentioned a little bit of critics um, over what did not happen with the not the, the best coal deal. Um, so and there was the war in the Ukraine since uh, February this year. So what did or what did go on since last year since the COP and what uh, did not go on and what should have gone uh, gone on uh, in the last uh, uh, nearly 12 months um, from the countries. Um, so, if we look at the situation with the war in Ukraine, obviously it's, I would say, a tragedy. We can all agree on that. And I think it made people realize in a way that we cannot, that, that was like uh, one source of, inf one side of the debate that it made people realize that we cannot depend on uh, fossil fuels, etc. Uh, but it's also, since there's a gas embargo going on now, uh, for instance, in Germany, the coal plants that were supposed to be shut down um, by the end of this year are going to uh, continue running up until March of uh, 2024. So obviously there's a certain setback in terms of uh, energy needed, needing to be generated. And um, since we're turning away from Russian gas, we're turning to other sources of energy which are also not green. However, I think that on this topic there can be no real consensus at this stage because um, there is growing awareness that we need to turn away from fossil fuels, uh, but also there is the there is the uh, view that it can't happen from now to tomorrow. Um, so 
what we make of the situation is it it uh, depends the uh, people can opt to just switch to a different uh, non-green energy source but it could also be viewed as a chance to uh, especially during the infla uh, obviously the inflation is happening as we recover from that we can opt to recover in a sustainable way and that's something that i hope would happen um, what I also said is uh, the methane pledge that I mentioned. It's good to see that a few days ago, actually, Australia signed on as well. And I know Egypt also signed on. And not just that, Egypt is also partnering with Israel and the European Union, uh, which I think is something that we can all um, look forward to because that's something and that's an important way. Um, that's uh, an important way to start uh, this COP because obviously COP should be about like losses and damages. There needs to be a certain amount of finance, be through a loss and damage finance fund or through other structures that needs to be agreed upon. But we need to continue with the mitigation and uh, obviously talking about uh, deforestation, um, the methane pledge, the coal. Um, that is something that needs to be discussed um, and um, yeah that's uh, that would be it for now <laughs> thank you so um in at the last cop uh, the uh, different parties agreed to update their ndcs uh, until the next uh, cop so until uh, november and I think there are not many countries uh, who did this, I think. And only all of the big countries, only Australia, uh, did update their NDC. So it's uh, the national uh, climate goal, a little bit uh, easy. Um, and only they uh, made a good new goal um, for this. So what did you hope out of uh, the, the goal that every country should update their NDCs? And what did happen and why did it not happen? Yeah, so the realization last year in Glasgow was that you know what, what countries put on the table was progress, but it wasn't sufficient to keep us on track for 1.5 degrees. So that's why you know, the Glasgow Climate Pact had this commitment for all countries to come back one, one year later. And indeed, we did hope that you know, by shortening this sort of ratcheting up mechanism, which normally would happen every five years, if you follow the cycle of the Paris Agreement, by shortening it to one year, you would keep up, you know, a sense of urgency and you would keep up momentum. So not let those countries um, off the hook um, that didn't uh, submit those NDCs. Why um, haven't we seen more, um, more new commitments? I think the geopolitics certainly haven't helped, um, as, as you mentioned. Discussions within the G20 have been very, very difficult this year. So we're seeing like a lot of pushback there. Um, there are some bright spots. I mean, you mentioned the Australian um, plan. Also, uh, Indonesia has strengthened uh, their targets. Um, a few others have. We're still hoping there's a few sort of um, countries that we're still hoping will come forward with uh, a new N NDC um, on time for for COP27. Um, but I think it's perhaps worth looking at a few other sort of positive signs that we've seen throughout last year. I mean, of course, the mitigation discussion is really important and we sort of keep, while we're still in the presidency role as outgoing presidency, we'll keep pushing and keep urging um, other major emitters to, to commit uh, to more ambition. But um, I'd just like to mention, you, you, you mentioned um, deforestation. So um, what we will see now um, in Sharm El Sheikh is the launch of the Forest and Climate Leaders Partnership. So this is a new initiative which um, UK is convening, it's sort of following up on the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forest and Land Use, where we had 145 countries committing at leader level to um, halt and reverse deforestation and um, biodiversity loss until uh, 2030. And the idea now with this new forum um, is to have really like a high ambition group, 2025 countries who will really push this agenda forward, work on solutions, on initiatives to restore forest and who will make sure that these pledges are accountable. Um, I'd also just like to mention briefly um, a few new initiatives that have been launched. So last year at COP we had a declaration with South Africa, um, a new sort of so-called just energy transition partnership. So the idea of um, a coordinated effort um, by, I think it was five 
countries, um, five to seven countries who came together and negotiated this with South Africa, um, pledging $8.5 billion um, in support for the next three to five years to manage the transition in South Africa away from, from coal in a just way. Um, and we're now seeing four new such partnerships emerging. They haven't been announced yet, and there's still work to be done, but those will be with um, India, Indonesia, um, Senegal, and Vietnam. So some other sort of, um, major, major economies with whom we're hoping to make some, some progress. Again, this is coming out of the G7. So um, we are seeing some sectoral progress. Maybe we don't have the level of enhanced ambition commitments that we would have liked to see. And if you look at the UN reports that have come out, um, one last week, one this week, um, they are pretty bleak. But I think there is quite a good story if you're looking at certain you know, cooperation with countries um, and also at, at some of the sectoral developments, methane or forests and, and coal phase out. Uh, so you talked a little bit, Karim, about um, the youth um, part on the on the COP. So what are the, the main goals or what are your hopes that will discuss and will also follow a declaration afterwards? Um, all parties will sign um, on the, on topics. So maybe I think the word loss and damage or the, the topic loss and damage is a really big thing. Uh, but what's the, what are the other topics uh, that are important this year? Of course, um, so coming again from the same uh, point that it's an African COP, so um, of course loss and damage is one of the priorities that we are uh, focusing. Uh, uh, one other aspect is the uh, finance and climate finance and um, adaptation. Those are maybe we are very lagging behind. Uh, in Glasgow, we have made a breakthrough uh, maybe on almost all of those aspects when it comes to commitments and pledges, but again, uh, implementation and uh, reaching to the fair, um, I would say, progress that we should have for the moment. Um, and I mentioned uh, rightly that, that the latest report of the IPCC had just showed us again that we are, there is a huge gap that we have to cover when it comes to uh, the emissions and the measures that should be taken on uh, mitigation. So all of those are the priorities that we are trying to push on them. And maybe for that purpose, um, to, to, to be fair, usually the COPS is not, it's, it's a collateral uh, responsibility and everyone should be contributing to it to have a successful COP and a successful climate action internationally. So um, for that reason, uh, the Egyptian presidency had made also the efforts to bridge the gaps and to organize many informal, I would say, consultations in a way that we can have a common ground before the COP that to, to, to pave the way for the COP because usually the, the um, governmental negotiations will be heated up in the COPs, but before we are trying to pave the way, find the common grounds, build on trying to find a fair compromises between uh, the major uh, geographic uh, groups and, and, and countries. So I guess those, those are uh, mainly the priorities. Yeah, thank you. So for you, Asia, and for the climate delegation, what are other important topics or are the topics uh, Karim already mentioned uh, the most important uh, things? And what are your, um, are you have a position paper for that, so what are your positions as climate delegation as a German youth NGO out of this? Obviously we are coming from a very, obviously we are coming from a very privileged position. Um, yeah. Obviously, we are coming from a very privileged position, but we still believe that uh, loss and damage is really important. Uh, we are not the ones to call for how it should be determined, but we stand with those who are most affected by it. And uh, we also believe that there should be an increase in youth participation, obviously also in the national level and not only in the observer level. Uh, also, action for climate empowerment is really important. If we look at some countries that still don't have uh, the ACE hub was established, but if we look at the folk na national focal points, some countries still haven't designated any. So obviously, action for climate empowerment is really important to include it as education, um, uh, to educate not only 
the young people, but also those who are perhaps somewhat older, uh, so all sectors of the society. Um, we do believe that there should uh, be a balance when it comes to gender, women and gender. Uh, there is a disproportion in uh, how people are affected by climate change. Um, and obviously we also believe that from those from the global north, it's incredibly important to stand with the global so south or better said MAPA, so most affected peoples and areas. Uh, because they, uh, the climate change effect that we were warning every, that everyone was warning everyone about, are already being faced. If you look at the floods uh, in Pakistan, if you look at the current situation in the Philippines, obviously this is something that needs to be addressed. And at the same time, mitigation has to keep forward because if we don't mitigate climate change, then there will be no end to losses and damages. So that's something that everyone needs to commit to. Uh, so thank you. I have one question um, as well to Anna, and then I'll open the, the round, and you will also have the, the time to ask some questions. So if you want to think about it, uh, start now. Um, so Anna, you may already mentioned the COP presidency, will, you will give it to Egypt. So how does the UK want to participate and to also lead out of this role of some years now as a co-presidency because of COVID, um, lead also some climate negotiations in the next years? So we are in, in close contact with our Egyptian colleagues in terms of the handover, make sure that everything you know, is, is smooth and coordinated. And we are also hosting a few joint events um, at, at COP27 to um, continue promoting some of the initiatives that we launched in, in Glasgow to make sure these are followed up on. So I think there has been, there has been a good join up and a good uh, level of, of, of cooperation. It will be about finding a new role for us, certainly. So as I mentioned at the onset, you know, we're no, no longer going to be the honest broker, but we're now becoming an, a negotiating party um, by, by, our, by our own. Um, and so it will be really about, um, we also have the opportunity to push forward certain, certain issues. And we, I think I would be very confident that the UK will stay on the you know, very very ambition, ambitious side of, of the negotiations um, as, as we've also been, been in the past. In terms of many of the initiatives, um, we'll be handing these over, um, some of them to international organizations to make sure they become embedded and there is a proper architecture. For example, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, and the ARENA will lead on the Glasgow Breakthrough Agenda. So this is a few, a few sort of technology-driven initiatives across different sectors to make sure that this is uh, followed up on. And likewise, with many of the other initiatives, you know, be it sustainable agriculture or um, commodity, deforestation-free commodities, we're all sort of looking to integrate those um, into wider processes to make sure that we'll still be driving them to some extent, but we won't be owning them anymore because at the end of the day, the UK is one party and we, are, we need to be held accountable to our commitments as well. If I could just say one word on finance, because Karim mentioned it, um, I think this is going to be a really totemic issue at, at COP27 and um, it's clear that you know, the, the $100 billion commitment it has to be met. I think there's you know, no, no argument about that and it's, um, this has to be a top priority that this get, gets reached as soon as possible. Um, we've also been looking a bit um, during the UK presidency at access to finance, improving access to finance. There's been a task force set up which the UK has led jointly with Fiji, which has come up with a set of recommendations on how to improve access. And what's also been really important to us is to bring the private sector um, into, into this picture because public finance alone will not lift the necessary investments that we need. Um, we founded um, the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. It's now grown to over 500 members, um, finance institutions, central banks that have committed to realigning their portfolios and their flows to net zero. And I think it's there we need to keep pushing um, because it's really it's, it's where the money goes ultimately where uh, long-term decisions are made. You want to add something? Or? Uh, if I may, um, since deforestation was mentioned as well, 
uh, recently, actually a few days ago, the forest uh, declaration platform issued a statement to uh, go with their assessment on the progress. So obviously, mm, there has been uh, a notion that deforestation has gone down in 2021, and uh, not gone down in com uh, contrast to other years, but gone down in terms of not having gone up as much as people were expecting. So from that sense, um, we're kind of on a good path, but also uh, there needs to be a more ambitious approach um, if we want to meet the 2030 target. Obviously, at SB56, some of developing states where there were, uh, there were debates on what falls on, um, uh, what falls on um, emission reduction uh, through deforestation. So that's something that needs to be completely thought through. Um, from the last co from COP26, a good change um, that happened is, I think, a very promising election in one of the G4 countries. So I think uh, that we can all look forward to the fact that maybe deforestation in the world's largest rainforest could maybe go down if the elections are going to continue the way they're looking now. Thank you. So I'll now open the floor for some other questions. Um, it's pretty dark for me, so I think <laughs> you have a question. Um, we, have a, we have a mic for him? So yeah. Uh, thanks for your talk. Uh, I have a question. Um, because Egypt is not, uh, has a problematic uh, human rights situation, I think, uh, it's might not that much a democracy. Uh, do you think that there will be a problem for uh, NGOs, for example, or other organizations in uh, Egypt uh, when the COP is uh, starting? So, uh, thanks again for the question. Um, as I mentioned, um, regardless of the point that Egypt and the situation of the human rights in Egypt and, and discussing this issue, I don't think that maybe that should be the focus of our discussion. Um, the COP is a UN conference and we are the host country who's obliged to just facilitate the participation of this. And as I mentioned earlier in my intervention, that we hadn't just stopped by this role. We have played a further role by enhancing and advancing the participation of Egyptian NGOs and African NGOs. We are trying our best to do that. And um, until the moment, we haven't received any uh, real concern, except of maybe those, I would say, potential concerns that what could happen in Egypt. Until the moment, and it's nine days now to the COP, we haven't received a single uh, complaint about that. Thank you. Uh, so the next there, and then we go here. So this question goes to Anna, because um, you said that the UK tries to do everything um, in their power to make sure that e Egypt is able to um, facilitate COP27. But my question is, what is the UK supposed to do if um, your new prime minister, Rishi Zunak, just um, announced that he isn't even going to attend COP27? So how is it going to work if you're chief ne negotiator and decision maker in your country won't even attend the conference? So the prime minister is not the, the chief negotiator, so we've got, we've got someone else, um, fortunately I should say, because otherwise that would be a stretching task. So um, our, chief, our, our chief negotiator um, at, at the working level is, uh, is, is Archie Young and our sort of, at the ministerial level, it's uh, Alok Sharma, the co-president, and of course he'll be going to Egypt, and he's been the one who's been in close contact with um, with Sami Shukri from from Egypt and the team, and who's sort of made sure that you know there is close coordination and, and close join up on the various initiatives and um, and on the agenda. At the end of the day, you know, we'll be handing over the baton, so we'll be taking a step back as soon as the baton is, is handed over. Um, with regards to the Prime Minister, I mean, I can only say that's very regrettable. Um, maybe he will change his mind um, because there was a lot of uh, there were a lot of voices uh, calling, calling for him to go. Um, so let's see. I mean, he's only been in the office for like three days. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up hope entirely. But yeah, of course, we, we, need, to be, we need to be there with the political leadership. That's, that's pretty clear. And I think we, 
We have about, I think, four or five members of the government, so ministers who will go, um, in addition to, to Alex Sharma. So there should be a good, um, a good UK representation at, uh, at COP27 as well. So we have the next question here. Asya, um, you talked about the disproportion in losses because of climate change effects. Um, and I think you mentioned something like loss in finance pacts or something like that. And I was wondering like, what your ideas are for solving or attending these problems and if you could explain like, how, these, how this issue specifically will be um, discussed at the COP. Um, so there's a call for a loss and damage finance facility uh, coming from uh, several NGOs. If you are familiar with Climate Action International, they have put out a paper explaining how such a facility could be established under the Warsaw International Mechanism. Um, however, there is also a concern about establishing such a facility uh, because uh, if, we, um, if we look at the Green Climate Fund uh, and how efficient it is, has been, or better said, hasn't been, um, there's a question if establishing a facility would take too much time to make sure that the money is delivered. Uh, obviously, there is a call for it to be grant-based and not only uh, insurance-based. Uh, currently, uh, there's, um, and this is something that the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and uh, uh, development uh, is also um, a part of uh, its insure resilience, uh, which is there have been some uh, there has been some criticism of insure resilience. But there is also um, the there is also the att uh, attempt to put uh, to go through with the global shield, uh, and obviously these. Uh, this is something that needs to be discussed. The discussion was started very well. A lot of countries have um, have, note, uh, have declared that there is a need to uh, go through with finance for loss and damage. So, uh, for instance, if you know, Denmark pledged uh, as quite, uh, quite a sum just recently. There has also been from the USA, they have acknowledged that there should be a form of uh, repar climate reparation. So obviously we're on a good track. Um, there is, um, from what I've heard, there's a high possibility that uh, loss and damage will be on the agenda and obviously it needs to be on the agenda. Uh, but uh, the finance facility is one way that finance can be delivered and I think it's for the upcoming COP for everyone to discuss and decide what the best way to deliver the finance is. Thank you. So I think we have one last question there um, and then we'll go on to the last, last question of me and then we'll finish the discussion. Hello, thank you so much for taking the time to be here in present. I really uh, appreciate that. Um, yeah. Um, maybe, um, yeah, my background, I'm writing a bachelor thesis right now about the dominance of the global north and the UNFCCC. And um, yeah, I would really, we talked about civil society, we talked about the youth, um, but we also mentioned indigenous people, for example, um, the MAPA, and yeah, I see a lot of problems regarding um, the transparency in the process regarding access. We talked about COVID restrictions. Um, I see language barriers and maybe we have, um, we have someone from the global north, from the EU and, or not the, the European continent and someone from Africa. So maybe Karim, you can tell how you um, view, how your views are um, regarding a dominance of the global north in the negotiations if you see that um, people whose voices are really important are not um, as um, included in the um, um, negotiations as um, people um, from the Global North. Thank you. So thank you very much. This is a very good question and in the rightly time before the COP. Um, 
for a reason or another, yes, we don't have an equal representation when it comes to the global south and the global north, and we will be just away from any conspiracy theory here. Maybe it's, it's, it's the way that we need to do more to empower the global south um, when it comes to finance, when it comes to uh, just allowing the access, uh, building the capacities, Maybe I'm sure that we have to do more when it uh, comes to, th to those aspects. We are trying, um, I wouldn't repeat myself in, in what we are doing because we are a global South country and we are representing Africa here. So we are having, by a way or another, the same concerns and we're trying to reflect them. Um, there are uh, many fair responses when it comes from a country like Germany, for example. And Germany, one of the main countries who is contributing in this aspect. And just a word that I have to say here, that uh, you should be proud of your country. Uh, as Germany is one of uh, the few uh, developed countries who are up to their commitments, financial commitments, when it comes to international climate action. Yes, we need to do more, of course, but at least we are uh, doing, and you are on the track to do more. Thank you. So um, my, okay. So my last question is, is not a big question. It's um, so I will just hand over to to you all three um, to make one uh, sentence, one wish um, about the next COP. So what's your what's your wish for the next uh, COP starting in one and a half weeks? Uh, you can start and go on and uh, to Anna. I'll just be happy uh, to see a successful COP to deliver on all the concerns that we have mentioned today. It's an ideal situation to have all of them being delivered, but um, let's also just bear in our minds that we have a geopolitical situation that have been unprecedented after Glasgow. And we have many international crises when it comes to energy and food security, for example. That's why we are at the moment maybe keeping the commitments that we have made and implementing those commitments will be just a good start. Um, I could emphasize more on the importance of delivering on the hundred uh, billion uh, dollars commitment. And uh, just to give you an idea, delivering on this number even wouldn't be enough. The estimate is uh, we are talking about 5.6 trillion dollars needed for the developing countries to deliver their NDCs. This is the, just the amount of the number. So the $100 billion will be just a gesture to keep the confidence between the global south and global north, between the developed and developing countries, and to keep everyone feeling, having this feeling that we are on the same boat, we are just having the same mission to uh, when it comes to international climate action. Thank you. Um. Yeah, so I will keep it brief and say that I hope that this is going to be an implementation COP and not a diplomatic talk COP, because obviously we do need to have talks, but there also needs to be a considerate amount of action uh, taking place in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, because we have done nothing for years, um, not myself, someone else has been doing nothing for years, and I think it's time for everyone to act up. As you've said, it's an African COP, so I hope that it will be about justice as well and that we can try to get back on getting on track. Yeah, I would totally echo the implementation point. This is really absolutely crucial now. Um, when COP26 concluded, um, there was a sense that we have managed to keep 1.5 degrees alive, but that it, its pulse is very weak, and it depends now really on rapid action implementation. So if I have one wish is that we come out of COP27 and feeling that the pulse of 1.5 degrees is stronger than it was, um, it's maybe very wishful thinking, but yeah, that would be my hope. So uh, thank you all. Um,
So yes, uh, thank you all of you three uh, to come here to uh, to our uh, local conference of youth um, in in person. Um, I think this was a great discussion, um, and it was really interesting to hear about the the last COP, about your thoughts, about the the next COP. And so I hope all of you learned a little bit more. And um, yeah, thank you all for your uh, being here. I think uh, all of you a nice evening, and for you as well. Thank you. Thank you.